Well, good evening, everybody. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. For those of you that are watching online, uh, we're glad to have you uh, with us as well. We talked about this, uh, this diagram in regards to sin and how sin, the, the world that we live in, is broken. It's infected by sin. As a result, we are separated from God. We are born into sin, so we're born in a state of alienation from God. And then we saw in the garden that when Adam and Eve sinned, part of what happened is that they, were, they became spiritually dead. And we said that spiritual death is separation uh, largely from God, who is life. So when the Bible talks about spiritual death, it's largely referring to, it depends on the context, but it's largely referring to um, separation from relationship. <clears throat> and so uh, when we get into the nuances of, of what that means, we recognize that the only thing in all of God's creation he said was not good was what? That man was alone. We can't live in isolation. Isolation is death. That's why we need each other. That's why we need a relationship with him and a relationship with, with each other. He created us, wired us, hardwired us for love. To love and to be loved. It is in the very essence of who we are in our identity as his children and who we are in our essence of being created in his image and likeness. So we can sum up then what it means to be created in the image of God, number one, is that human beings, and you can write this down on your outline, human beings are created for relationships with God and others. So specifically in regards to our transformation in the image of Christ, our sanctification, we're talking about the implication for being created in God's image is that we are created for relationship with God and with each other. Isolation is death. Anything in all of God's creation that is separated from other things outside of itself. And we've talked about this. If you put a plant under a box, over time, what's going to happen? It's going to die. Because it is dependent upon things outside of itself to live. It's dependent upon the sun. It's dependent upon the air. It's dependent upon rain and so forth. And so it is not independent. So we are created for a relationship with God. And then number two, we are created uh, as human beings. We are created to love and be loved by God and others. This is, this is the essence of what it means to be created in his image and likeness. Love, as we've said, is the oxygen of the soul. You and I cannot function. We cannot function as God created us to function alone or without love. So think of love as the fuel. Love is the rocket fuel that makes the abundant life work. Without love, it's not going to work the way God uh, intended it to work. Okay, so tonight then, we're going to get into uh, more in depth on what does it mean to be created in the image of God, to be loved and be loved. I want to give you a little bit of a history um, in, uh, in psychology. Back in the uh, early 1900s, John Watson uh, became known as the father of behaviorism. And behaviorism was basically that, uh, that time when psychologists wanted to move away from the from psychology as kind of a spiritual uh, means of diagnosing things to a more scientific means. So when the Enlightenment hit, the, uh, the, the psychology used to be referred to as the, uh, the care of the soul. And so early on, psychology and theology, there was no issue. There was no issue. What, what drove the wedge between the two after the Enlightenment was this desire of psychologists to become real scientists. And so if you can't measure it in a laboratory, you're not a real scientist, right? And so the Enlightenment was driving us more into uh, what became known really as Newtonian physics. So basically Newtonian physics is all the things that you can touch, okay? So anything that's tangible. So if you can't touch it, if you can't see it, if you can't measure it in a laboratory, then it's not real. And so things like feelings and uh, things like love and emotions, you can't measure those, at least they thought. And so they started distancing, psychologists started distancing themselves from those less tangible things, moving more to a hard science that can be measured in a laboratory. Behaviorism fit into that perfectly because behaviorism just basically measured behavior. And so they didn't think about or they didn't really emphasize anything in regards to the heart, 
in regards to emotions or feelings or anything like that. It's that you are basically a product of positive and negative reinforcement. And so that's really what Watson uh, kind of was coming out of. Now it's important in regards to uh, behaviorism, children, raising children was being looked at as something you don't want to, you don't want to dawdle over your kids, right? You don't want to, the idea of nurturing children and, and comforting them, and that was just, that, they, they thought that was useless, basically. And you can see this quote by Watson, when you're tempted, he said, to pet your children, which is kind of a bizarre thing, but you know, just to touch your children, remember that mother love is a dangerous instrument. Dangerous, and, yeah, dangerous statement, right? We know a lot more now, don't we? Now, obviously, Watson had a bad mommy, okay? I mean, he's just, uh, he's just established that. You know, he's a good-looking guy, but anyways. All right, this, this guy you're probably familiar with from your Psychology 101 classes, B.F. Skinner, basically uh, worked within the same field of behaviorism. He's, he's known as the father of operant conditioning. And so basically operant conditioning was measuring behavior based on positive or negative reinforcement, okay? So if you're, uh, if you're, for example, if you're a kid on the school playground and you're smoking with your buddies and you get accepted in the crowd, then you're gonna, that's positive reinforcement for that behavior, right? If you turn green and start puking and everybody thinks you're an idiot and a, and a wimp, that's negative reinforcement. And so basically they tested rats in laboratories and they had all kinds of gizmos. What, Skinner had this thing they called the Skinner's box where he'd put these rats in. If they would move a lever and get food, then they would go back to that behavior. And so it's just all this kind of stuff that you can measure. The problem is, and this is why this is important, is that in, uh, during uh, the, the war, World War II, a lot of uh, children were orphaned. And so in Europe, you had all these orphanages, all these institutions that were uh, that had all of these children, and there weren't enough caregivers to provide for them. And so there was a study done in 1945 where the physical needs of the babies uh, in these homes, in these institutions, were, were met. They were fed when they were hungry, their diapers were changed when they were wet, so they were, their, their physical needs were cared for. A behaviorist would say, that's all that's necessary. That's, that's all that we need to do. But because of the shortage of caretakers, only some of the babies were held and talked to. The ones who were not held showed drastically higher rates of illness and even death. God created us to connect. He created us to need human touch. And we see that proven here. In addition, the study revealed that the psychological development of these children was either slowed or stopped just because they weren't being nurtured, just because they weren't being held. The study and others like it graphically demonstrates that a baby can get sick and die or her growth can be stunted because of a lack of emotional bonding. So again, this is just clear evidence that God created us for a relationship. He created us to need human connection. Perry Harlow comes along. Again, he's, a, he's, a, he's around the same time as B.F. Skinner. And with all the behaviorism, and the, the minimizing of children's needs in regards to nurture and care and love and warmth. These kids are dying. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Harlow comes along and says, you know what? I think we need love. Yeah, right? The, uh, the obvious. But how do we measure that? And so he started, he started with some experiments that have become, today would be, widely unethical. Actually, animal rights came out of probably some of these experiments with these, with these um, racist monkeys in 1950. And basically what he did is he had two surrogate moms, and you see that in the bottom picture with the monkey, one that had, um, you know, kind of terry cloth that was soft and comfortable. There was a, a light in both of these so that there was warmth provided, but it was on the wire baby or the wire surrogate mom that had a, a bottle. And what they discovered is that the monkeys would come, start sucking on the bottle, but then almost uh, immediately, because of just the uncomfortableness of that, would leave and go to the terry cloth mom. So I'm going to show you a video. Now, for those of you that are really sensitive to animal issues, this is going to be a little difficult. They're not being abused, but it's a little sad. 
But what I, I want you to put this in the context, though, of this saved the lives of I don't who knows how many thousands of children, because Harlow's experiments changed everything, and now they started validating the need for love and the need for nurture, and so. Uh, this will kind of this this will kind of take us back a little bit in time. Conquest, the search for new knowledge about our universe, our world, and ourselves. This monkey is an orphan, separated from his mother since the day of his birth. Literally, his life hangs by a thread. A soft cheesecloth pad that is his only companion, his only comfort. Once a day, the pad is removed for cleaning. This is the laboratory of psychologist Harry Harlow. Distressed. Permanently deprived. He is studying monkeys to better understand human relationships. He may die for want of love. Harlow believes he can use science to study love. With a series of pioneering experiments, he explores territory where few scientists have ventured. Harlow said that there was such a thing as a science of love, for example, that love, the kind of intimacy that characterized relationships between mothers and infants, although in his case he studied monkeys, um, could be the object of science, that you literally could move love into a laboratory, put it under a microscope. Harlow is studying love because he believes it makes an indelible impact on a young life. The relationship between a mother and her child, what Harlow calls our earliest social environment, could hold the key to explaining behavior throughout life. Harlow designs a set of ingenious experiments. He raises a baby monkey, allowing it to choose between two surrogate mothers, a wire mother that feeds it, and a cloth mother that doesn't. A cloth mother that Harlow thinks might provide something else, comfort and love. Here's baby 106, weaned on a wire mother. He's going to the wire mother. But this infant quickly runs to the cloth mother where he will stay for the next 18 hours cuddling. In Harlow's mind, choosing nurturing over sustenance. In another experiment, Harlow creates a fearful situation. Whom does the infant turn to now? Let's find out what his reaction to his mother are when we frighten him. That's what any child will do in a similar situation. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. To Harlow, there is something about the experience of comfort and love, even more than food, that seems crucial to all these monkeys. But what happens when the infant is raised alone? without any mother at all, wire or cloth. In this situation, the orphan monkey stays alone. He won't even go to the cloth mother when frightened, but retreats into his own world. Harlow believes he has shown how want of love can damage an infant for life, and he worries the same is true for people. What comes through loud and clear in Harry Harlow's experiment was that the early experience and the environment were crucial to the healthy development of, a, of the infant child. And that in a sense, if you messed up, if the right kind of maternal presence was not there during the critical years, then that infant might grow up to be an adult incapable of forming healthy relationships with other kinds of people. And if, if an infant doesn't have the love that it needs, that it was created to need, that God created us for, it's going to have detrimental effects as it as it grows. So you can you can understand that if when a child is neglected or when uh, that child is not nurtured or cared for, even if it's all of its physical needs are taken care of, God created us to need love. 
we can't do it by ourselves. We are, we are dependent upon God and we're dependent upon others. So just remember this, I want you to write this down in your outline. Love is life. Love is life. Jesus commands us to love one another. There's over 51 another commands in the New Testament. To love one another, serve one another, encourage one another, admonish one another. All these one another commands. Love is life and isolation is death. It is not good to be alone. So this has some interesting implications if you think about it. The Holy Spirit is what? With us always. That post-Pentecost believers, <clears throat> we have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. That had never happened before Pentecost. So we have the Spirit of God living in us, guiding us into truth, affirming us that we are children of God, <coughs> strengthening us, encouraging us. I mean, we have the literal Spirit of God within us. <clears throat> we have the body of Christ around us. So God has provided for, for our emotional and our relational needs through His Spirit and through the body of Christ. So the church then should be the safest place on earth. It should be the safest place on earth, the place where you can be your true self, you can be real, you can be vulnerable, and you can do so without any fear of reprisal, any fear of rejection or abandonment. And ultimately, we know that's not the case because we're all still, we all still sin and we all still mess up. But one of the things, one of the ministries I believe we have to each other is this ministry of connection, of love and being loved and supporting one another. And God created us to need that. Okay, so when we're talking about uh, creating His image, we obviously recognize we need love, we need nurture, we need support. Love, then, is the primary virtue in the Christian life. Love is, it, it's, it's everything. It's so essential. It's essential to your growth and transformation into the image of Christ. Without love, you are going to be stunted in your spiritual growth. And so when Jesus talks about the great commandments, it's kind of interesting. Very familiar to all of us, but I just want to reiterate that Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. So love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So, Jesus then says that this is the first and greatest commandment to love God, and then the second is like it. And he says, all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. What Jesus is saying is that you can sum up the entire Bible, all of God's revelation, in one word. Love. To love God with your whole being. That's what body, soul, mind, and strength. It's your whole being and to love each other. John even goes on to say in 1 John that if you don't love your brother who you see, how can you love God who you can't see? So John even equates spiritual maturity and evidence that we're truly saved by our love for each other. That's how essential this is. This is a big deal. This is a really important uh, element in, in our Christian life. And we see it all over the place. I put these uh -huh. verses there on your outline. Just over and over and over again, love is the primary virtue. Love is the most important thing. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, And now these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, Do everything in love. Galatians 5, 13, Serve one another in love. <laughs> Philippians 1, 9, And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Romans 5.5, 5, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So we're not even left to our own resources in regards to love. He commands us to love, and then he pours out his love into us so that we can. He gives us everything we need. 1 John 4.10, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and send his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave. He gave. 
He gave His one and only Son. 1 Corinthians 13.1 Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Verse 2 If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Verse 3 If I give all I possess to the poor, and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Do you get what Paul is saying here? Nothing else matters. This is the most important thing. It's not that nothing else doesn't matter, but this is the most important thing. Other things matter, of course, but this is the, this is the, this is the big deal. 1 John 3.18, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We've talked a lot about that. John could have used any number of different attributes to describe the character of God, right? He could have said God is holy, he's righteous, uh, you know, but he said he's love. That everything is defined. Everything God does is motivated by love. Everything. Everything towards you as his child, as his son or daughter, is motivated by love, not anger. God is for you. He's not against you. He doesn't punish us. He disciplines us. There's a big difference between punishment and discipline. Punishment is motivated by anger. Discipline is motivated by love. Discipline is, is for correction. Punishment is to balance the scales. And so even, even in how God works with us as his children, it's all motivated, it's all motivated by love. Ephesians 4.2, Paul says, Be completely humble and gentle, bearing with one another in love. Colossians 3.14, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 1 Peter 3.8, all of you live in harmony with one another, be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. I could go on and on and on. You guys get the picture here? Yeah. Love is a big deal. We are created to love, and we are created to be loved. Without love, we're not going to function the way God intended us to function. That's why we need each other. That's why the body of Christ is so essential to our transformation. Love heals and love grows. So let's look at it like this. A lot of times we go through life kind of sealed up. And we can choose to resist love. All right, I want you to write that down in your mouth. We can choose to resist love. We can resist the love of family, of friends, of co-workers. We can even resist God's love. And, and here's the catch-22. It's in relationships that we've experienced our greatest pain. And it's in our distortions of God that we hide from even Him. That's the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned in the garden, remember? When God said, where are you, Adam? And, and Adam said, I hid because I was afraid. And God's like, that's a new deal here. What, what are you afraid of? And we are afraid that God is angry with us. But what we need to understand as, as believers is that God's wrath, there is no more wrath of God towards you as a believer. He poured out his wrath on sin at the cross, the whole thing. Jesus drank that cup to the dregs. There's nothing left. There's not one ounce of God's wrath that is left for you and for me. Paul says in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. God is for us. God loves us. God wants the best for us. Always. And so in our distortions of God, because of sin, we tend to hide from, try to at least, hide from even Him. We don't go to what we need for life. And that, that source of life was just in our relationship with Him. And so, so many people go around life in this armor, trying to protect themselves from getting hurt. Their hearts are locked up. They're not letting anybody inside. And, and that's, you cannot live the abundant life living like that. That is, it's impossible. Because you're just, you're living in isolation. And so why do we do that? Well, there's a lot of various reasons, but I think shame is the, the root issue in sin. That when, shame, when sin takes place, shame is immediately, is immediately there. There's, there's various responses of shame. You have hurt, uh, hurt causes, um, Feelings of shame, guilt, fear, blame, anger, pride, judgment. You know, it's interesting. We talked a little bit about this. 
Uh, anger, pride, and judgment are all defense mechanisms where we try to keep people away so they don't get too close to us. And so we just were angry, hoping that we're going to intimidate people to stay far enough away. Because if we let them get too close, then they're going to see who we really are and they might reject us. Rejection is our greatest fear. It's our greatest fear. Why? Because God created us to connect. He created us to need relationship. And so we hide from our family. We hide from our friends. We hide from uh, our, our co-workers. We hide from God. And it's a sad state of affairs. But we can choose to receive love. We can resist love or we can receive love. So I want you to write that down on your outline. Now there's a difference between experiencing love and receiving it. Does that make sense? You can, be, you can have people around you that are very loving. But if you don't let that love inside to touch you deeply in your heart, it's not going to connect. It's not going to have the effect that you need. And so what happens is, is that we need to take our armor off in order to be loved. But when we do that, we become vulnerable. And we are terrified of being vulnerable because it's when we're vulnerable that we're susceptible to being hurt, right? And so that's why we stay in isolation. That's why we stay in our armor. That's why we hide. But what needs to happen is, is that we need to have safe enough relationships with some people that know us, who we are. They know all about us. They know our good, bad, and ugly stuff. And so uh, we need to take our armor off and stop protecting ourselves. And we need to take, let down our masks and stop pretending. You know, masks are a really interesting thing. If you have a mask on, basically you are pretending to be something that you're not. So you're a poser, right? So somebody walks up to you and says, how you doing? I'm doing great. Praise Jesus. Right? I got victory. And you're dying on the inside. You're just lying through your teeth is what you're doing. But you're afraid that if I tell this person how I'm really feeling, that they're not going to be interested. They're going to reject me. They're going to think I'm a loser. They're going to think I'm a high maintenance person. Whatever it is that we're going to think. And so we just keep it all locked up inside. And when we keep it locked up inside, we slowly die. If you are living, if you are living behind a mask, you cannot receive love because your true self is not being loved. What's being loved is your mask. The person you're pretending to be is who's being loved, not your true self. That's why vulnerability and authenticity and being real is so essential to our transformation because then you're letting love get inside. The way you let love in is by letting people see who you really are, warts and all. Letting them see all the pain, all the garbage. Now, you don't do that with everybody because not everybody's a safe person. So there, it's, it's a few people. I, I, I hope that most of us can be safe for each other in here, but that's the idea. Because that is, that is the dream of Christian community, is to be a place where we can bear each other's burdens, not shoot each other in the head because we have burdens, where we can encourage each other where we can care for each other and comfort each other. So when I am weak, you're strong. When you're weak, I'm strong. And that, that, there's this reciprocity. That, that is what the body of Christ is supposed to be. That is how we are to, to be with each other and caring for and, and helping each other. Not hiding. Sin causes us to hide. Sin causes us to wear masks. Sin causes us to pretend and to protect. That does not let the love in that you and I need in order to thrive in order to grow, in order to flourish. So then, how does the heart <clears throat> heal and grow? Well, let me, just, let me just say, first of all, when we're talking about healing, I'm talking about healing wounds in the heart that are, the result, that are relational wounds of not being nurtured, not being comforted, not being loved the way that you needed to be loved. And those things create, those cre it creates damage. Rejection, bullying, there's a, there's, all, there's a variety of different things that damage the soul and damage the heart. We're going to talk about some specific things in a minute, but we've talked about, remember we were talking about things that have shaped us spiritually? Life experiences, our family of origin, uh, even, even the body of Christ, and things, things affect us. We experience those things through our five senses, and they hurt. And if we don't deal and process the hurt, it doesn't go away. 
when you bury pain, you bury it alive. It just sits there and seethes. And so what you do is you try to hold it down so that it won't, you know, it won't expose itself. And, 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 and trying to hold it down over time, it just gets exhausted. And that's why you start seeing people blow up. You know, pastors, you know, you'll find a, a pastor who's a successful pastor, has a thriving ministry, and then all of a sudden, he, he blows himself up through committing adultery or doing some, you know, embezzling money or doing something like that. Because what happens is, is that where does a pastor go to be safe? If you have problems as a pastor, you get fired. That's typically what happens, right? Because you're supposed to be perfect, right? You're supposed to have your act together. Nobody wants a pastor who doesn't have his act together. And so we, we, we create this impossible situation for our, our, our shepherds and our leaders because they can't be real and deal with the pain that's going on in their lives. And so what do they do? They just keep performing. They just keep preaching, keep growing the church, keep building it bigger, because then I'm important, because then people are going to notice me, and we just keep going and going and going and going. Well, it's no, it's no different for guys in the corporate world and gals in the corporate world, right? Make more money, increase your net worth, become more important, build bigger buildings, you know, build bigger companies, whatever it is. And so, so often, what's driving all of that ambition, what's driving all of that is pain, unresolved emotional pain. And it doesn't produce the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live. You will never talk to anybody on their deathbed. I promise you, I've done this. Who regrets not making more money, who regrets not being more successful, who regrets not doing, you know what they regret? They regret not spending more time with the people they love, the people they care about. That's what they regret. It's interesting to me that at the end of life, relationships, which is what is to drive a healthy, thriving, flourishing life, is what we tend, is what we regret. And so it just comes full circle. It's, it's so essential in our, in, our, in our growth and transformation. Okay, there are two dynamics that play out in regards to, to growing us up and healing us up from the inside out. Empathy and acceptance. When you have empathy and acceptance, you create an environment of trust. <clears throat> and in an environment of trust, your heart grows. And what, what brings about that growth is a willingness to be vulnerable, is a willingness to share your heart with another human being. And there's science behind this as well, we're gonna to get to that by the end of our evening, that validates this, this very thing. Empathy, empathy is such an essential element in our relationships. And it's one of the, I think, one of the primary ways we can minister to each other is to, to empathize with each other. So what is empathy? Uh, well, I want to show you a little clip by Brene Brown, who's kind of the empathy expert. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. 
I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least, you know, you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. putting yourself in their shoes. It's different than sympathy. Sympathy, like she was talking about, sympathy is feeling bad, sympathy is trying to fix it. Empathy is just getting there and just sitting with them and just like, you know what? Me too. I've been there before. I'm sorry. It's just listening. It's just comforting. It's carrying their burden for them, helping them. And so empathy creates this, this environment of trust where I want to be more vulnerable. I want to share more of what's going on inside of me. And, and a lot of times what happens, what should happen, frankly, especially in Christian marriages, is that the Christian marriage should be the safest place, the safest relationship on earth, where your spouse knows everything about you and still loves you. That's grace. Without, we can, we can have all kinds of knowledge about grace in our head, that God loves us and that I'm saved by grace. and all, That's all great and it's important. But if we never experience grace in our human relationship, friends, we've got to realize that the body of Christ is a conduit of, in a tangible way, the love and the grace of God. 1 Peter 4.10 is that God manifests his grace in its various forms within the context of relationships. <clears throat> And so he has created us with, a, with an ability to care for each other, to be conduits of his grace, of his love, to each other. And that gives life. Now, remember we talked about, we, we've looked at different variations of this diagram over time. But telling our story is a huge uh, part of the transformation process. Letting somebody else know us know who we really are. And so, as we've been looking at this diagram, we've seen that we have our, our heart, which is our inner being, and within our heart, we have our thoughts, emotions, and will. And so, it begins in our thoughts, our thoughts affect how we feel, our feelings affect what we do, and so when Paul talks about, that's why the New Testament talks so much about transforming your mind, about taking thoughts captive, about having the mind of Christ, that there is a reason when we're talking about the mind, we're not talking about our brain, we're talking about our inner being. Okay? Your, your inner being tells your brain what to do. Your brain is just an organ that basically <coughs> controls your body. But it does what the mind tells it to do. And so we, we, we looked a couple weeks ago, we looked at, at, at our thoughts, and we talked about toxic thoughts, we talked about healthy thoughts, and how toxic thinking causes us to have certain feelings that result in certain behavior. And so whenever we want to change some kind of behavior that is sinful behavior or it's something that's hurtful or destructive to somebody else, then we need to trace that back to its origin, to its, its root issue. We're not just trying to focus on behavior. That's, we're not talking about behavior management. We're not talking about sin management. We're talking about an inner work transformation from the inside out. So instead of, for example, swatting the mosquitoes, go drain the swamp, right? If you just spend your life swatting mosquitoes, you're just dealing with the symptoms. You're not dealing with what's driving the symptoms. 
And so this is, in any kind of recovery program that's going to work, we're going to focus on, yes, the behavior is a problem, but it's not the problem. The problem is there's something else that is driving this behavior. And so we've got to get to what that root is. And usually that root issue is some kind of unresolved emotional pain. And usually that unresolved emotional pain is the result of some early child developmental um, lacks. And we have all kinds of studies that help us to see that over and over and over, <coughs> over again. So when we're talking about our inner being, what we got to realize is that we are shaped by a variety of dynamics in our lives. Our family of origin affects us, society affects us, life circumstances affect us, and even the church <coughs> affects us, and the Holy Spirit. Now, and it's not all negative, obviously. Obviously, the Holy Spirit doesn't affect us in a negative way. But there's plenty of negative experiences that we have in life that shape us spiritually, that affect our inner being. And so what happens is, is that we start to derive an identity as a result of all of these various influences. And so that's why it's essential that we take, that we take our, our, our identity from our relationship with God, not our relationship with all these other circumstances in, in, in the world. But these have a powerful effect on us. We experience all of these various things through our five senses. They shape our identity. And that, that core identity is that part of who we really think we are. And that goes back, if you're neglected, if your dad says you're stupid when you were a, a young child, that's going to have a, that's going to, that's going to uh, embed itself in your inner being. It's going to wound your heart in a way that is going to have implications down the road. And so there's all kinds of things that can happen in our lives through these various areas that create damage that needs to be healed. And that needs to get healed in the context of relationship. <laughs> you cannot heal the wounds of the heart in isolation. It doesn't work. Why? Because God created us to need relationships. So again, it's all coming back to the same thing. But relationships are our greatest need and our greatest fear. Right? So it's, it's like this. I, I want you to come close, but I'm afraid. And so we've got this thing, this dance going on, because if I really let you inside and you reject me, then what, then what, then what am I going to do? And so we tend to just let people come in so far Right? We have our armor on, we have our mask on, and we basically just do life that way. Never letting anybody really get inside, into our hearts, into our inner beings. And the abundant life is the result of being known. It's the result of being loved and loving. And so what happens is then, all of this negative pain that affects us here, we just kind of carry it around with us throughout life. It manifests itself in hurt, fear, shame, anger, pride, judgment, guilt, blame. All of those uh, are a variety of ways in which we either push away or are afraid of letting anybody get inside, letting anybody get close because they can hurt us. And so this, friends, this is what I believe is the biggest barrier to spiritual growth and transformation in the church today. Because we're not teaching this. What we're teaching is you need to read your Bible, you need to pray, you need to serve, you need to give, and those are all good things to do. But if you're not letting, if you're not in addition to those things, if you're not doing that inner heart work, there's only going to be so much transformation. And so that's why we need the body. That's why we need all of these relational dynamics playing themselves out. One of the most powerful means of healing and growth is telling your story. And here's what's interesting. Dr. Kurt Thompson is a psychiatrist and he's been doing a lot of study in the area of the brain sciences. And what he has discovered, and this is partly in, in what they're calling uh, attachment theory as well, is that when you actually sit down and share your story with someone, Every time you share your story with someone, you're getting a different experience in that relationship. So if I'm sharing my story with you, Nan, 
you're going to respond to the things that I share with you in a different way than maybe I would if I was sharing with Dan. But when you're responding back to me with empathy, with care, validating my pain and hurt, that starts changing what's going on in my brain and how I remember and understand that. What's interesting is that the brain, there is no past or um, future in your brain. It's all one, one thing. Because you're, it's all there in your neural network. It just depends on which things, which, which memories are firing in <coughs> relation to, to which. And so you can rewrite your narrative, your understanding, your interpretation of your story, of all the experiences that you had in your life that were painful and hurtful. When you're sharing that with someone, and they're responding with empathy, with acceptance, with love, with grace, with kindness, with mercy, with compassion. All of those things start changing your perspective of what actually happened. And there's a neurological dynamic that, that plays itself out. It's quite interesting. Dr. Thompson, in his book, Anatomy of the Soul, which I referred to before, which I would highly recommend you reading, it's excellent. Um, he says this, he says, knowledge alone does not satisfy. What does satisfy is being known. The process of being known is the vessel in which our lives are kneaded and molded, lanced and, searched and sutured, com confronted and comforted. And all that happens in relationships, he's saying. Bringing God's new creation closer to its fullness in preparation for the return of the king. It is the communal container, I like that phrase, communal container. It takes its shape and gives birth to the graces of love, joy, peace, patience, all the fruits of the Spirit. He goes on to say, transformation requires a collaborative interaction with one person and empathetically listening and responding to the other so that the speaker has the experience, perhaps for the first time, of feeling felt by another. And what he means by that is when somebody else actually communicates to you that they are feeling your pain, feeling what you're feeling, that creates a connection. And what he's, what he's gonna say in a minute is that there's a neurological connection that happens as well. And a beginning of a transformation from a neurological standpoint because of how you are starting to now remember your experiences. He goes on to say, a person who listens empathetically and responsively as someone else tells his or her story is able to validate the storyteller and through questions and musings arouse that individual's curiosity so that he or she will consider alternative ways to imagine his or her story. So you actually start rewriting your own story because of how you're experiencing that, that other person. At the same time, emotion and memory have been buried deep in the storyteller's right hemisphere and lower, and lower brain emerge. So those things that we have buried in our unconscious, remember we said that 95 plus percent of our behavior is driven by our unconscious, which is crazy when you think about it. And so there's stuff that drives behavior that you might, that's why sometimes we wonder, why, why do I do what I do, right? I mean, Paul in Romans 7, why am I doing this? Why? And he said, well, it's sin that dwells within me. Okay, well, sin is that stuff that's buried inside of us. That, that, but it's not just sin that I've committed, it's sin that's been committed against me. And so when <laughs> sin's been committed against me, it creates hurt, it creates damage. That needs to be dealt with. That, that is the sin that is buried deep within me. Now, I also have my own sin, right? So it's not just somebody that, I'm not just a victim in this. I, I um, perpetrate this as well. But sin, as we saw last time, all sin, whether it's sin I committed or sin committed against me, results in the same thing. Death, isolation from life, guilt, shame, and condemnation. It doesn't matter if it's sin you committed or committed against you, it still creates the same dynamic. He goes on to say, this interpersonal interaction exposes these functions of the mind and facilitates the integration of various layers of neural structures and brain systems, which in turn creates new neural networks. The firing patterns of these networks, though previously potentially available, did not exist before such interactions took place. So what he's talking about, and we, we talked about this weeks ago, but the plasticity of the brain, that your brain is constantly changing and shaping. It's not formed in concrete. 
that your brain grows and changes as you, as you pay attention and think about, think about things. You can change your brain. You can change how you think about things. And so our thoughts affect our feelings, which affect our behavior. So one of the ways, one of the key ways that we change behavior is by getting to the root thoughts that are driving that behavior. Does that make sense? And so all of this stuff is interconnected in, in that way. And as you are listening to somebody's story or sharing your story with somebody else, it begins rewriting it. That's going to affect how you think about it which is going to affect how you feel about it, which is going to affect what you do about it. OK? Does that make sense? Right? Dave, you want to add anything to this? No, you're doing a good job. OK. All right. All right. <laughs> what was that? Dave, like, Dave's like, Dave King's like, it's all Greek to me, man. Whatever. Right? Dave, just love people. OK, can you do that? All right, if you can do that, we're good. We're gold. All right. Um, I've, got one, uh, I've got one video clip by Dr. Thompson, uh, Thompson, if you guys want to see it, and he talks a little bit about some of this stuff, it's real quick, and then we'll break out and, have, and, uh, and do some uh, group stuff. Here we go. There are perhaps many reasons whereby which we have come to where we are in history. One thing seems to be rather evident, and that is that we love knowing things. We almost have an insatiable thirst for knowing things. It also appears that most of our interest in knowing things is in order to control and reduce our distress and anxiety that largely comes not because we don't know things, but because we are not known. It's interesting that we live in a world that for the last perhaps 300 years has largely been shaped by an ethos that encourages and invites independence, invites people to make their own choices without necessarily needing to be connected to other people. That tends to be a very different plausibility structure than a biblical one, which from the get-go addresses the world and says, let us make mankind in our image. Let them then rule and have dominion over the earth. Let them live like us, essentially. And that's a pretty crucial statement because we hear in that that the intention for women and men by God's design was for us to not simply live together, but that we would be increasingly more deeply known by one another. It's interesting that one of the ways in which the Hebrew texts understand what God meant by bringing to Adam a helper was one who mirrors Adam to himself. That I'm not just helping him with the laundry, I'm not just helping him with dinner, I'm helping him to see himself. Interpersonal neurobiology, interestingly enough, is tending to give us different information than what our typical scientific direction tends to go. It tends to say, we don't really know ourselves until we see ourselves in somebody else's eyes. This is replete throughout the biblical narrative. Even though it's being newly discovered by neuroscientists in the 21st century, this is information that, as the writer to the Ecclesiastes would say, is not really new under the sun. We're just simply putting a different spin on it. So to the degree that we aren't just simply striving to know information, but to the degree that we are willing to be known by others in all of our dreadfulness, in all of our darkness and strangeness, is the degree to which I then become known to myself. And I can't really do that, nor will I experience that, I think, with God until and or unless I'm doing that with other people that are just sitting three feet away from me. 
basically what he's talking about is how we tend to focus all of our knowing things based on facts instead of knowing things about each other. And so he talks about the dynamic of just what, basically what I was saying. So I'm just going to use that to support that. He goes into great detail about this in his book, again, which I, I highly recommend. I think it will be helpful for you. OK, so let me just sum up real quick before we go into our groups. Being created in the image and likeness of God, number one, is about being created for relationship with God and with <laughs> others. And it's about being created to love and be loved. And love is everything in regards to our growth and change and healing and transformation. It's just so essential. It's not just about getting more facts in your head. It's not about performing. It's not about stopping doing anything. It's about entering into relationship. And the change that needs to take place in our lives happens from the inside out, not from the outside in. And so that's why what we're talking about is so essential. And, and why we really need in our discipleship to Jesus, as we are being transformed in his image and likeness, we play a part in that. And part of our role is to be willing to go into these places and expose and share ourselves and be vulnerable with each other. And as we do that, we'll start to experience life in a different way than we could ever experience it otherwise. Now, I put some questions uh, on your outline that will kind of walk you through the, uh, the main points that, that I referred to tonight. So I'd like you to do, and again, this is kind of part of our, our neurological assignments that we do each week because uh, you hear something, you write it down, you talk about it, you have a much higher retention rate. And so um, what I'd like you to do is just get, get together with groups of uh, three or four people, five people, and just take the next 15 minutes or so just to kind of, you're not going to get through all the questions.